Welcome to this first gentle introduction to marine remote sensing. We'll look at what remote sensing is, what it offers us that we can't get from conventional marine measurements, and what it actually involves. So what is remote sensing? Well, imagine I'm standing on the street and a friend comes up to me and asks me to close my eyes. And then they hand me a flower and they ask me to guess what it is. I can probably feel what the leaves are like and I might be able to feel the petals and I might be able to name it as a flower. But is this remote sensing? No, it's not. Let's put the flower back where it belongs. And then if it's daytime and the sun is shining, then when I open my eyes, I can see that there's sunlight falling onto the flowers. And I can see that because some portion of that sunlight is reflected into my eyes. And that is remote sensing. So it's defined as gathering information about an object or a group of objects without actually being in contact with it or them. So this was one kind of remote sensing using visible light. In this situation, I might also have heard the bee flying along, which would also have been remote sensing. So it turns out that all of us are already quite expert at remote sensing. And we use remote sensing all the time to ask questions about and gather information about our environment and to navigate through the environment. Let's put this into a more global context. To collect information about all the flowers on all of the land surface of the area would require a program of uh, quite intense observation by probably more people than we have on the planet. And so we seek solutions that allow us to observe large areas of land at a time. In the ocean, of course, that's 70% of the Earth's surface, and so the situation is more extreme. But it makes sense to put our sensors onto a satellite and have them orbit the planet. So these sessions will be defined by focusing specifically on satellite-based sensors. So what does remote sensing offer us that conventional marine techniques don't? Well, if you look at the data from one single sensor, uh, that's mounted on the AQUA satellite operated by NASA. And this is data taken from one day. So as the satellite orbits, it views this narrow swath and the Earth is turning as the satellite is orbiting. So in the course of two days, these little black swaths that have been missed in the first day are filled in. So in the course of those two days, we have covered the entire surface of the Earth and that's about 500 million pixels, where each pixel is about a kilometre by a kilometre. And in this image, the land has been blacked out and also sea ice has been blacked out. But you've also got areas of black, for example here, where you have cloud. So we can get data from the whole planet in the space of two days, assuming that we don't have cloud obscuring the view with this sensor. Let's compare that to more conventional techniques, and here I've chosen the Argo floats, which are uh, free-floating profiling floats. And this figure shows all of the operational floats for the whole month of July in this year. So that's three and a half thousand odd floats. So the, the points look fairly large, but don't forget that each float only takes up less than a square meter. And in fact, over the history of science, we still don't have coverage from the entire surface of the Earth. Let's take a closer look at those images. This satellite image records sea surface temperature on the 21st of June this year. We see a general gradient from the equator towards the pole of warm waters at the equator to cold waters at the poles. And we see some evidence of smaller features associated with fronts, upwellings and eddies. In this case, the 21st of June, however, in the Arctic, the sea ice is still in the process of melting. So there's no signal for sea surface temperature from here. In the Southern Ocean, the sea ice is in the process of forming because it's winter. So there's also no sea surface temperature signal from this band around the Antarctic continent. It's also important to consider the time length of any data record and the Aqua MODIS instrument has been operational since 2002. And before that, uh, the weather-oriented satellites, the NOAA series uh, of AVHRR sensors, was operating for around 20 years. So altogether, we have now a continuous sea surface temperature record 
from satellites of over three decades. Here's the image of floats for July of this year. And firstly, we can see that our distribution spatially is fairly even, except again around the Southern Ocean, closer to Antarctica, there seems to be some gappiness. Closer to many of the continents where there's a continental shelf expanding outwards, there's also gaps. And again, in the Arctic, there's very little signal there. And again, that's attributable mostly to sea ice uh, because the floats can't transmit if they can't reach the surface. If we look at the time record for these sensors, we can see that most of them are less than 10 years old. So the Argo program altogether is barely a decade old. So we have a short record from these sensors. Let's take a closer look at one of the most inaccessible areas conventionally, which is in the sea ice zone. If we try and measure things from a satellite here, on the one hand, we've got no extra cost because the satellite will orbit and collect data uh, once it's launched. It will just keep going until the sensor fails. On the other hand, some parameters, so including sea surface temperature, can't be measured through the sea ice layer. In comparison, we might be able to send a ship to this area, but it would be expensive. And for this um, kind of ice thickness, you would spend time ice breaking. And a ship costs around £20,000 each day to run. So the more time you spend trying to get to your sample zone, the more money you're spending. Of course, it can also be dangerous. So we've considered the continuity, the length of time of different missions, and we've considered spatial coverage, and we've considered things like clouds and ice. It's also important to consider depth. The oceans are around uh, 3,000 meters deep on average, and they can be much deeper or much shallower depending on where we are. So in the visible light band, light enters and penetrates some tens of meters uh, before it might be backscattered back from the ocean and from being backscattered it can reach a satellite. So that electromagnetic radiation signal at most comes from the upper tens of meters of the ocean compared to 3,000 meters average depth. If we take a ship to a particular sampling location we can lower instruments right through the water column. And the Argo profiling floats profile every few days and transmit every few days. So from a ship, we can see the whole of the water column. Another important thing is to consider what we can actually measure from these different bases. So satellite-borne sensors are only useful for deriving parameters that are in some way interacting with electromagnetic radiation and changing the electromagnetic radiation detectably. From a boat, we can actually take a water sample. So we take a CTD rosette usually with Niskin bottles on it, and we can choose the depth at which those Niskin bottles are taking a sample. Once we have a physical sample of the water in hand, we can do a huge range of analyses on it, be they chemical, physical, or biological. So to summarize, satellites provide us with excellent spatial coverage, in this case, long time series, and a daily to monthly repeat rate, so high temporal resolution, and that varies a little bit with the parameter we're trying to measure, the cloudiness, and the wavelength that we're looking at. Ships and conventional sampling techniques provide us with much better depth resolution, a much broader range of measurement parameters, and much better spatial resolution, but they don't give us that same coverage. So finally, what does remote sensing actually involve? Well, first of all, the sensor needs to be designed and built and launched. So that includes physics and maths, it involves some rocket science, and a lot of electronics and engineering. I would call that remote sensing science. The next thing is that the data that the satellite collects need to be transmitted to the ground. The sensor might need to be controlled, so there needs to be an uplink possibility as well. And the data need to be archived for security and they need to be distributed. So once those data have gone to the interested parties, then they can be used for oceanographic analysis and that involves statistics and some computing. And that stage feeds back uh, up the chain towards the design and the development of algorithms for future satellites and future data products. A slightly different question is what does it involve to use remote sensing data? Now we'll start with understanding what's actually happening with the electromagnetic radiation that we're detecting. 
So this is background information about how electromagnetic radiation is absorbed and scattered, how it interacts with the surface of the Earth. The next thing is to know roughly how the sensors are collecting data and how parameters are derived. What kind of algorithms are there? What are the processing levels? What's all the jargon mean that the remote sensing community uses? The really key thing is understanding how this information can be applied to your particular oceanographic question. So what kind of parameters are measured? What is the limitation on the measurement of those parameters? How accurate are they? How frequently do they occur in time compared to the variability of your parameter of interest in time? What's the temporal resolution, the depth resolution, the spatial resolution of the satellite data compared with the parameter that you're trying to look? And finally, we need to analyze our data, which means formulating our question quite specifically and then applying statistical techniques appropriately to answer that question. And this could be looking at um, trends in space or time, relationships between multiple parameters. So thank you for watching. I hope that was useful.